बोधिताम भगवता नारायणे न स्वयं व्यासे न ग्रथिताम पुराण मुनिना मध्य महाभारतम् सतोमा सत्कमया तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृतम गमया आविरावीर मगेति रुद्रयत्ते तक्षिणम मुखम ते नमाम पाहि नित्यम पे द डिवाइन लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोर्टैलिटी मे द डिवाइन कॉन्शियसनेस फिल आवर हार्ट्स एंड प्रोटेक्ट अस So today we will continue with our reflection on the Gita with one very important idea that gets stressed again and again in the Gita, and that is the idea of swadharma. This is the term that occurs at least in four different places in the Gita. we saw that the basic problem that arjuna had was he was confused he didn't know what his duty was when he came to the battlefield that morning he didn't have any doubt which is why he had got and prepared for the war and he came but once he was there and when krishna placed the chariot in between the two armies and when he saw his own people his own relatives his own friends people who were close to him people whom he had great respect for on the other side and it hit him very strongly that now have to fight these people and he got confused he got bewildered he didn't know what his duty was and that's the kind of a dilemma that you and i can also face even today that sometimes in a specific situation or in a certain stage of life we may not be sure ourselves what exactly my duty is so that is what we will try to take a look at today so the word is swadharma the word dharma comes again in many different contexts it comes in the vedas it comes in the gita it comes in many other books of the vedanta tradition the word dharma comes from the sanskrit root dhri and it means to hold or to support and so the word covers a, a, a wide spectrum of ideas it's not always possible to translate the word dharma into just one word in english because depending on the context uh, the, the word dharma can have many different connotations and we will take a look at these different connotations as we as we go along today in general it can be said that there are two kinds of dharmas one the sanskrit terms for these is called sadharana dharma and vishesha dharma now sadharana dharma the word sadharana means generic or common or universal so there is a universal dharma and there is a specific dharma now universal dharma means something that is obligatory on everyone every living being irrespective of your age irrespective of where you are from irrespective of any other consideration something that is universally obligatory and so what are the kind of things that are included in uh, sadharana dharma 
the generic term. Things such as being truthful, being honest, being kind, being unselfish. Every one of these things which we normally consider as good qualities, qualities that are worthy of having, uh, these will come under Sadharana Dharma. This is a duty, if you must use the word duty, this is a duty for everyone. In this particular context, when we use Dharma in this way, as a general thing, as a universal thing, it looks more like, better translated as a virtue. So, a generic Dharma or a Sadharana Dharma is Dharma as virtue. But then we know that while we share a lot in common among the people of the world, every one of us is also unique. In certain respects, we are same like other people. In certain respects, we are different. So depending on the differences, depending on the special characteristics that a person might have, there are certain special dharma attached to that person. So the specific dharma or vishesha dharma is better translated than as a duty. So the generic dharma is dharma as virtue. Specific dharma is dharma as duty. Now, dharma is duty often gets um, in classical books gets defined in two different ways. And that is dharma according to the duty according depending on the stage of our life and duties connected with our special positions we hold in the community. The stages of life, uh, are the Sanskrit word for the stage of life is ashrama. So the student stage of life was called in, in Sanskrit Brahmacharya ashrama. The next stage of life was the householder stage or the time when we start the family. So that stage was called Grihastha Ashrama. The third stage of life is when the children grow up and the parents then lead a retired life, a life of retirement. Um, so that was called Vana Prastha Ashrama. So you can see the words. Uh, Grihastha. Stha means to be in, to be established in, to be dwelling in. So, grihastha, griha is home. That's how in the, the word in English of the householder, people who live in a house, in the family, called grihastha. The third stage is vanaprastha. Vanam in Sanskrit means forest. Vanaprastha means those who are forest dwellers, who go and live in a forest. So, in the Vedic times, when the children grew up, uh, the parents then left all the family duties and maintenance of the family traditions in the hands of the grown-up children. And the parents usually retired to what today we might call retirement homes. But in olden days, they used to go to some ashrama of some rishi, hermitage of some rishi in a forest. And so therefore they are called forest dwellers. And the fourth stage of life, after having lived in the forest, in that spiritual community, having followed all the disciplines in that place, then these people were expected to have attained sufficient inner discipline and purity to then embrace the fourth stage, which was called the sannyasa ashrama, the, the life of a hermit. When they went forth, no longer being part of that forest community, but just trying to live on their own, depending on no one but God. So four stages, student, family, 
retirement, and then hermit. There's also um, references in the Vedas that it was not necessary that everyone had to pass through all these four stages. So the, the last stage, when a, the idea is this, that if I have carried out all my duties as expected in these different stages of life, then by the time I reach the fourth stage, my heart will have become pure, pure enough to be fit for that last stage of life. And then one renounces everything, depends on no one but God, and he goes forth. The Vedas say there is a saying which says, Yad ahareva virachet, tad ahareva pravrachet. Now what they said was that one doesn't necessarily have to go, it was not mandatory that you have to go through these four stages. At any stage in life, if one feels that higher calling to live on nothing but God, then one could then skip these interim stages and go straight till the end, the last stage. But one has to be careful. If one skipped these interim stages before being fit for that final stage, then um, not only would there be no benefit, uh, there could be a great harm because once uh, it's a question of whether we are using the time and energy that we have in life in a productive manner. So, there was a duties associated with every stage of that. So, as a student, there were certain duties connected with it. As a family person, there were duties. We know, as student, we have duty towards our studies, towards our family, towards our parents. Then, when we start a family of our own, then the other earlier duties don't disappear. Yeah, they are still, we are still children of our parents, so we might have some more duties to the parents, but in addition now, we have a duty towards our spouse, a duty towards our children, and then <coughs> when we, and then duty to maintain the family traditions, the, the regular puja, the, the, the rituals and so on that the parents have handed down to this person. Then, when the children grow up, go to the retired stage, and then you have certain duties there of doing whatever was expected at that stage, doing, spending more time in prayer, meditation, and so on. And then finally, you go to that last stage, which had its own duties connected with it. So, it's important to note that we're just talking about duties. Nowhere is there a word for rights. And you can see how the ethos has changed to the times in which we have come. Nowadays, people, it's not that people don't talk about duties, but duties are seen more as a kind of a burden. On the other hand, people demand rights. We have a bill of rights. We don't have a bill of duties. But it's good to recognize that every right comes attached with a certain duty. If all the time focused on are my rights and I completely ignore the associated duties, then there's going to be a problem. A lot of the social dysfunction we see in the world today is, I think, too much stress on rights and not enough stress on duties. But in the, the, the scheme that we find in the Gita and in and these ancient Vedantic books, the stress was on duty. So, there were duties connected with every stage of life. Now, <coughs> we all hold different positions in, in a community. A community requires the different kind of functions to be accomplished. But every community has to be diverse. Um, today that's not so much a problem because most societies everywhere are already diverse. Now, 
the different kind of positions that we hold that are necessary for a maintaining a community uh, often got um, divided. You could say the kind of a four archetypal uh, functions in any society. There were the priest, the warrior. These are just kind of just the labels. Uh, priest, the warrior, the trader, and the laborer. So we needed clearly every community would need at least some people taking care of maintaining the, the traditions, studying, reflecting, meditating, um, fulfilling the need of the society related to God and the life beyond. Things that we consider as religious and spiritual duties. We need people taking care of that. But a community also needs people to protect them. So we need the administrator. We need the the what today we might call the armed forces for defend for defending the community, for taking care of administering. So you need politicians. You need leaders to keep the wheels of the community running smoothly. But the community also has to eat. It also needs things to carry out its daily functions. And so commerce becomes an important function in any community. So we need a section of people taking care of trade and farming and all of that so that all of our needs get fulfilled that way. And then finally, all of these functions will need people who are willing to work because a lot of this involves not just manual labor, but intellectual labor, labor, scholarly labor. So all kinds of labor comes under one category called the labor. Now the terms that, that get used for this in classical books is a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. <coughs> now there are references to these four archetypes. In the Vedas, there is a very ancient hymn in the in the Rig Veda called Purusha Sukta, where it is said that these four archetypes, the four types of functions needed in any community, any society, all of these originate from that one big cosmic person. So, the Vedic Rishis saw, as, as we have seen on earlier occasion, the universe, not simply as a, a dead materialistic entity, but as a living entity. So there are, they see, they often have the idea of what they call the Virat Purusha. This whole entire universe seen as one huge cosmic living being. And so then the Sukta, Purusha Sukta shows of all of the, the people fulfilling these different requirements in a community all originate from that one cosmic being. And then we find in the Gita several references. Uh, Krishna says in one place, Chatur Varanyam, Maya Srishtam, Guna Karma Vibhaga Shaha. These four, the, the word usual, Varana. I created these four archetypes. And how, how were they divided? Guna, Karma, Vibhaga Shaha. Divided on the base of their on the basis of their qualities and work. Now, because these references to the four archetypes are found in the Gita and the Vedas, and then later on, the, the social divisions that got formulated in the Indian subcontinent, which later became known as the caste system, have made people think that the caste system is sanctioned by the Vedas or the Gita because there are references. Now, what we can say is that yes, whenever that caste, when that caste system evolved in the Indian society, the terms Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra 
were taken from these old shrimp pecks. But there is no evidence that the caste system, as it is understood, that the, the social groups that were formed itself had any sanction. Because all that the Vedas say is that these diversity that we find in our community emerges from that same divine source. That's all that it says. And what the Gita says is these divisions can be understood in terms of differences in guna and differences in karma, quality and the work or the function that they do. So this, this is a, the way the caste system, which is much, much discussed, much maligned, uh, people either get very upset about it or very defensive about it. Um, whichever way we look at the caste system, uh, it does raise very strong emotions. And so it is good to <coughs> look at it as objectively and as calmly as we can. One helpful way to understand this is to is to see how these social groups may have been formed. Any kind of a social institution takes years, decades, sometimes centuries to form. It's not that just a, a committee of people sits down and says, oh, these are the four groups and you belong to this group and you belong. It never works that way. All of these groupings, they occur over a period of time, almost unconsciously. Um, so, we can speculate of how things may have gone. No one knows for sure, but one way to understand that would be, think about, and remember, we are talking about a society several thousand years ago. Okay, so, what may have been the situation then? Clearly, Every community were of necessity very insular. By that I mean, this was way before there were jet travel. This was way before people could easily go from one place to another. If your primary mode of travel is by walk, or maybe at some stage in history then by um, going on a bullock cart or something. There is a limit to how far you can go. And therefore, <clears throat> every community had to be self-sufficient in its own way. They had to grow enough food to be able to maintain themselves. Every community needed uh, some scholars, some priests to be able to carry out the religious requirements of that community. You needed uh, leaders, you needed people to administer that community. Uh, you needed um, people to grow food, you people uh, to do farming. And you needed people to do all the, the work that required a lot of labor. That community needed at least one, depending on the size of the community, they needed at least a doctor. In olden days, they used to call him a Vaidya. And the system that, the ancient system of Indian medicine was called Ayurveda. So you needed some Vaidya, some physician. You needed a carpenter, at least one in a, in a, in a small village. Now what if, let's say, the, the son or daughter of a physician said, I'm not, medicine doesn't interest me. I like to do art. I like to do music. And the community would say, no, sorry. Remember, there were no medical schools to go to. There was no schools to go to, to learn any trade. The only way you could learn a trade was from seeing what the elders in your family did. And therefore, 
a physician who would eventually grow old had to pass on their knowledge to their children. And then the children grow up and then they continue to serve the community from the skills they have learned from their parents. And then when they become parent themselves, they pass it on. That is how a lot of these functions became hereditary. It was not because it was mandated by scripture or anything like that. It was just the, the social need. There was no other way for them to do that. And therefore, people had no freedom, the way we understand it today, to do whatever they wanted. I mean, they could. For instance, if a physician's son said, I'm not, I'm not that interested into medicine, I want to do music or, or art, the community would say, great, do it on your spare time. When, after you have carried out your functions as a village physician, if you have some extra time, by all means go and practice music or art. But you have no freedom not to do this because this community for one generation afterwards is going to need a physician. Same thing with the carpenter and blacksmiths and whatever else uh, is needed for our daily living. That's how the caste system as we know it gotten identified with, with certain uh, uh, hereditary qualities. The qualities that were passed from one family, one generation to the next. That's how Varna, what was originally Varna, then became increasingly known as Jati. The word Jati in Sanskrit, it really means the word, it comes from the word birth. So depending on whichever family you are born in, you inherit not just the family name, you inherit also the family activity. So Swami Vivekananda once famously referred to the caste system, just a trader's guild. And that's what it was. So Arjuna, now, coming back to the, the context that we are looking all this into, Arjuna was, belonged to this second warrior caste. And so we find Krishna, we saw in the second chapter, the 31st verse, if you look up in chapter 2, verse 31, Krishna says to Arjuna that you need to fight. Because for a Kshatriya, it's your duty to fight because there is nothing higher, nothing better for a Kshatriya than to fight in a war that is that is righteous, the war that is justified, that war that is not, you don't go to fight in order to go and kill. You don't go to fight in order to go and create violence for violence sake, but you fight in the cause of justice. If such a situation is called for, after having exhausted <coughs> all means for peace, then you have to fight. Uh, in the second chapter again, in verse number 33, Krishna tells that if you don't fight, you will lose your dharma. See verse 33, uh, he says you will lose your dharma, you will forfeit your dharma if you don't fight. And there's another one verse, <coughs> which, uh, two verses actually, which convey this idea that better to do one's own dharma, one's own duty, even if, if it is done imperfectly, than to do someone else's duty, even if it is done perfectly. And this, this idea comes in, in this, in chapter 2 and then chapter 18 as well. Let's see, chapter 3, I, sorry. It's in 3, 335, yes. Uh, the 35th verse in the third chapter says that it's better to do one's own dharma, better to even die doing one's own dharma uh, than, than do someone else's dharma. And that idea comes again in the 18th chapter, in the 47th verse. And therefore, this idea of Swadharma is important. So we have seen so far what Dharma meant. Dharma as a virtue, Dharma as duty. And how that duty was applied 
to different stages of life and different functions in life. Now we can say that, <coughs> well let me put it first this way, the different qualities, uh, we, uh, Krishna says in the Gita that these four groupings uh, are based on both quality and work. So the qualities we could um, very in a general way say that the one group of qualities would be qualities associated with with um, qualities such as self-discipline, uh, studying, um, living peacefully. So peace, harmony, studiousness, self-discipline, uh, these are one set of qualities. A second set of qualities are uh, associated with with leaders, uh, the being protective, being activistic about improving, uh, reforming, creating, being uh, creating reforms. Uh, it needs uh, some amount of ambition, uh, and it needs administrative skills. So duties that are associated with these would be a second group of duties, a second group of qualities. And a third group of qualities would be uh, the qualities that are necessary for business. Uh, all the qualities that we would associate with, uh, with a good business model. People have to be far-sighted, people have to be able to take risks, people will have to uh, be good at calculating of how much to invest, how much you get back, all of those things. Uh, and these qualities are important. All of these qualities are important. For the running of the community, we need these qualities. And finally, we need qualities which are uh, uh, service-oriented. People willing to give their time and energy in doing things. And so, <coughs> It's good to recognize that all of the, in all of the discussions so far, there has been no value judgment passed about that these particular quality is somehow better than the other, or this kind of work is somehow better than the other. What is stressed throughout that every work is as important as every other work. Swami Vivekananda in his Karma Yoga lecture says that sometimes when we, if we make the mistake of thinking that somehow ruling a kingdom is a higher, better, more important job than mending my shoes or, or repairing my shoes, uh, Swami said that would be a wrong way to look at it. He says, sure. If someone who, a shoemaker, may not be able to go and rule a kingdom, but neither can a king come and fix the shoes as well as a shoemaker does. And so everyone is great in their own place. Every work is as important as any other. But we know in life, human beings being who they are, well, we're talking about they, we, human beings who we are, we are constantly judging. We are constantly making value judgments. We are constantly thinking about this is better, this is not good. This is higher, this is lower. And therefore, although in the scheme of things, every work was seen as equal, but the, the human tendency was to make these judgments. Now in the olden days, there was this difficulty that it's possible that someone might have a quality, a certain quality meant for a certain task, but they were born in a family which was traditionally doing a different task. And there was really no choice. So they often had to do the work for which they may not have had neither the interest 
nor the skill for it. But there was there was no much space to be of some flexibility. Maybe a little bit here and there, you know, the specific situation they might have had. By and large, there wasn't that much freedom. In some extent, we can say that today we are in a much better position than in the Vedic period. Because now with jet travel, if there is certain work that needs to be accomplished and we don't have the people to do that in our own community, we can outsource it. Or we can bring people over from some other city, even from some other part of the world. So, our situation in some ways is better. That today, no matter what my parents' job may be, no matter what career they may have, if I have interest in something else, I have the freedom to do so. But of course, there are limitations because I might have the freedom to do it, but I may not have the opportunity to do it. So society is a very complex organism. In theory, we can say, I mean, theory we do say, any person can do anything. We are a free country. And, well, that's true. But every one of us knows we might have the freedom to choose, but we may not get the opportunity to choose. And that opportunity can be can depend oftentimes on factors such as ones. I mean, there is so much going on right now about the differences in race. We know not everyone from every race or a, the the color of the skin does make a difference between what kind of opportunities are available. Same is true in other parts of the world. If it's not race, then it could be caste or it could be class. So there are these different factors because of which this theoretical freedom to choose may be constricted because of these factors. So, guna and karma, the qualities, each quality associated with these four functions of a priest, a warrior, a trader, and a laborer, um, and the work itself. Now, ideally, if I have a quality for something and I am called upon to do that particular work, that's the best situation. But as we saw, it was not always possible in the Vedic time. It's not always possible even today. I said that people make judgments, and so there has been this tendency in the Indian subcontinent, for instance, for whatever reason, the Brahmins were considered like the top of the, the cream, and then you just kind of went downwards. And, so there, and therefore, you have these phrases used like lower caste. Why lower? You know, that's, that's what I mean by these value judgments. When you say lower, you are really making this division between higher and lower. Why not just say different? Because they are different, that's for sure. But that's not lower for that uh, on that account. So that's that's the difficulty that is that is there. It's also good to remember that none of these divisions were watertight compartments. It was not like one could not go from one grouping into another at all. In the Gita itself, Drona, the teacher of Pandavas and Kauravas, who taught them archery, um, was not a Kshatriya, but didn't belong to the warrior class. Drona was a Brahmin. So, these crossovers were possible. It's possible that a Brahmin might be so skilled in some um, qualities and skills necessary for a warrior class, they might even become teachers of those who belong to the warrior class. So, it's good to recognize that there were plenty of exceptions, but this was the general 
general pattern. There are, there are so many ideas connected with it, and um, I, I want to at least make a mention of many of them um, because it's, it's a big, big subject that we are trying to reflect on. An important factor to be remembered also is that there are things in life which don't change with time. Um, for instance, in the, there are things in the, in the Vedas with all discussions about the nature of the Atman, the spirit, anything dealing with these unchanging things, the, the nature of the divine, the Supreme Being. Now, all those insights were as true 3,000, 4,000 years ago as they are today. Because we are dealing with entities. The Atman doesn't change with time. So, those ideas are, are unchanging. But every other discussion that deals with social institutions cannot remain fixed in time. Because society itself changes. Sure. The basic nature of society may not change. There are certain things in, in society that don't change, but there are a lot of other things that do. Even that's why we find elders in the family often is speaking about the good old days. Somehow, everyone has a good old days. Um, anyway, so... Um, <laughs> Societies change, and the social institutions that need to change, reflecting the other changes, and that's that's also we see kind of a debate, and there's clearly there is no um, unanimous agreement on this, even about interpreting the constitution. Should we interpret the constitution based on the prevalent reality of society, or interpret it? in the light of how it was written, say, 200 or 300 years ago in the case of the United States. Um, so, do we have to look at it the way the founding fathers saw, or do we have to see it in light of the re present reality? Because a lot of things that are happening now were not even conceived of 200 years ago, 300 years ago. So again, so there is a lot of debate about these things. The same thing with regard to these structures of society into these four categories, for instance. So the way the caste system evolved. I made a brief mention about how people make judgments about higher and lower. Now I want to make, say something also about the need for change and the resistance for change. Any kind of a social, whenever there is a, a social institution, no social institution is perfect. And whatever form that institution is at any given time, it is going to benefit a certain section of people and it is going to not benefit certain other section of people. Now, as society changes, the institution has to, has to, also has to change. As society evolves, the institution has to evolve. But those people who are benefiting from the way that institution exists are going to resist that change. But they're going to lose the benefits. Those people who are on the wrong side or on the, on the, the losing side of that institution would want that change. So this kind of... Uh, tension between wanting a change and preserving it, the status quo, uh, exists in every society in one form or the other. And people might, might call them conservatives and liberals. Or, or these are just labels. But we find that, that this tension between wanting to preserve and that preserving the old or change both may have a lot of agenda attached to it. Both may involve parties 
who stand to gain either by preserving it or by changing it. So the caste system is also in the in the Indian context is is facing this tension. In fact, the way the caste system exists today in India is is a major force is just politics because every kind of a social grouping becomes a special interest group and if you can it's easier to mobilize and manipulate a, a special interest group than an entire population it's much easier to do that and then what what sometimes they call the vote bank so so politics is one big factor which while they might say publicly this has to go they have a reason to keep it alive while it, it could be keeping caste identity alive in one part of the world they could be a race identity keeping alive in some other part of the world or a class identity keeping alive in some other part of the world so keeping these identities which separate people simmering um, is something that politicians often do because it it helps them the caste system in india again it again uh, becomes a big issue on when the time of marriage again not in every family but some orthodox families would want that the their child be married into a family belonging to the same caste the the vedanta teacher under whom i studied used to say that um, people holding on to class identity is very selective and at, at only specific times these are the same people who might who who are so uh, finicky about caste distinctions the same people go to a restaurant and eat they have no idea who has cooked their food and they are just fine eating it or who comes and serves it at their table when they are traveling in a bus or a train or a plane they have no idea who is sitting next to them but when they go to a temple or something they might be oh, who is a lower caste who is a upper caste you can see the the hypocrisy involved often times it's very unconscious but 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 it's there and while the brahmin is often considered um the topmost in that in that uh, caste ladder um the pandit under whom i studied used to say that if people only read the books and had knowledge of what is required of a brahmin what are the the life of discipline and uh, the the rules that the brahmin had to follow no one would want to be a brahmin so everyone kind of sees the privileges attached to these different functions but don't see the the price that has to be paid for it and so a lot of these identities have become just labels and have lost their original intent and meaning and so it's a big subject again uh, i'm not pretending to solve all the problems connected with it in this small little reflection but it's good to recognize that that um, what remains is just the shell of the the plan social plan that should have unfolded and evolved along with the changes in society and that's not what has happened so then just to conclude very briefly how does this help me how can i today in the 21st century how do i know what is my swadharma clearly we can't no longer the asking question what caste i belong to am i a brahmana or kshatriya is just pointless the societies in which we live there is really that 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 structure um, no longer holds true it still is a big deal in textbooks but but in real life it 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 hardly ever makes a ripple except on as i said on certain situations and in certain places by and large the institution is gone 
and just the shell and the name remains. It seems to me that what is required is a basic self-knowledge. Self-knowledge with a small s. If every one of us tries to look at ourselves as objectively as we can and find out what are my qualities, what are the strengths that I have, and what are my weaknesses, what are the predominant characteristics that I have. Again, none of these characteristics are in themselves greater or, or, or lower in any way. They're, they're just different. And we need, we need these different skills. So if I am clear about what qualities I have and what job I can do where these qualities can be best employed in the best, most productive way, I must of course try to find that. And if I am lucky enough to find a career or a job which matches my talent, my skill, my interest, well, that's God's grace. But again, as I said, sometimes we might have the freedom to choose, but not an opportunity to do that. In such a case, we can make our best effort to find a work or find an action that best matches my skills and whatever then job comes. A devotee of God will say, this has come to me through the grace of God. And if this is the situation in which God has placed me, I take it that this is what God wants me to do. And then carry out your duty as best you can. In the spirit of Karma Yoga, even if that work or that job, that choice was not your first choice, since that is what has come to you, do it as best you can. And one can continue to pray. And oftentimes it is seen that if I carry out the duties and the responsibilities that have come to me in my present stage, if I carry them out as best I can, then through some inscrutable universal functionality, and we don't know how it happens, and that's why we call it grace. Eventually, circumstances around us rearrange themselves in such a way that we will find a work, we will find a place that best matches our own qualities and interests. And we need patience for that. We need faith, we need patience. So that's, that's how I see it. Clearly, it's not a very easy question to answer. But every one of us, therefore, when we ask ourselves today, what is my swadharma? What we need is to look within, find one's qualities, one's interests, one's skills, one's talents, and try to match it with the things we can do in life. And if, if that match works, that's great. If it doesn't work, we must do the best we can nevertheless and with patience, with faith and with some amount of struggle eventually we'll find this guna and karma will come together. But ultimately, and this is the last and very important point, we should not allow our work to define us. From a Vedantic perspective, the goal of life, something that Sri Ramakrishna stressed again and again, the goal of life is to realize God. And there is nowhere is it said that only a priest will realize God. In fact, no. Anyone can realize God, no. Irrespective of what work they are doing, irrespective of what stage of life they are in, every one of us has the ability and we have that there is a possibility of us realizing God. What is important is not what we are doing, clearly, the work has to be ethical and moral. So long as what I do is ethical and moral, 
it doesn't matter how society looks upon that work. What is more important is how I do it. No matter how menial the work might appear in the eyes of society, if I am able to do that selflessly, if I am able to do that in a spirit of Karma Yoga, I have a better chance to be enlightened than someone who might be doing the kind of activity which might seem a very higher activity. But if that person is doing that with a lot of self-interest involved, with a lot of selfishness, then that person, there is no chance of being enlightened. So it's not what we do, but how we do it, that's important. So these are some of the ideas that I wanted to share with you this morning about Swadharma. As I said, there are lots of connected ideas with it, but uh, these are some of the uh, insights that will help us uh, reflect a bit more on this subject. So as we have done on um, earlier occasions, we will take a five minute break now. And if you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free, uh, free to share it. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohot Mohoha So we will take a look at some of the questions that have come. Before I do that, a happy Father's Day to all of you and I am very happy to receive um, greetings from many of you. So, happy Father's Day. There was a, somebody sent me a picture of a, of a little boy wearing a, a t-shirt and in front it was written, um, my father rocks and then we turn back and the behind it was printed but my mom rules. <laughs> okay. How do we know that the calling is real to go to the last stage? We will know this only if we have good self-knowledge. In fact, that's the kind of a question that often gets asked when sometimes one chooses to go and join a monastery or a convent. When I, when I decided to, to join the order and become a monk, I was 19 years old and uh, that was what many elders in my family said. You think you have a calling to be a monk. You, what do you know? You're just, you're so young. How do you know? And that time I felt no, I think I know this is a calling. Now, luckily, through God's grace, it, it worked out that it happened to be a right call. But sometimes it does happen that those who choose to either join a monastery or a convent or, or maybe in India go to the Himalayas, the great spirit of renunciation might after some time feel just get bored or discover that, no, no, I think I better go back. I miss my home very much. So, there is really no, no objective way to know whether the, to know whether the calling is real or not. The only guarantee is that if I can know that uh, I have good self-knowledge of who I am, then I may be in a better position to to decide. And it's not just about actually going to the last stage. It's about any other career one might choose. Should I go to medical school or should I go for engineering or should I study law? What calling do I have? People, people do make choices and maybe after they start, we join a medical school and after a year discover, no, I really don't enjoy it much. So, maybe so, we make changes. So, that's what we need to do. Do we have to be okay with the measure of inequality 
in order to avoid unnecessary tension. I don't think it's a question of being okay. I think in every society, there are always going to be these two forces. Um, as I said, there are people who stand to benefit by maintaining the status quo, and there are people who stand to benefit by changing the status quo. So when we find inequality, there are always going to be forces in society. Uh, no one can stop it of trying to bring equality, and we need those forces. But there will be also counter forces trying to preserve the status quo. And this tension is, is just the way life is, just the way the world is. There's never ever going to be a time when there are no tensions of any kind. If the tensions stop completely in every sphere, in every part of the world, the world as we know it will end. So what keeps it going are these forces, polarizing forces. Something trying to do one thing and the other resisting it. That's just how life is. Swami Vivekananda often referred to priestcraft as a problem to society in general. What did he mean by that? As I said, um, every every grouping, every social grouping is equally important because they are performing a useful function to society. But then certain groups will try to, it's not the group themselves, but the people, it's, it's the nature of people to try to exploit the weak and to accumulate power. So these power hungry people would try then to, to subdue and get benefit thereby. And the function that priests do, potentially there is a lot of opportunity to exploit other people. Because if I'm the only one who has studied the texts, and if I can say, I can manipulate these higher powers to hurt you if you don't give me what I want, then I have a measure of control over you. And so the knowledge that these priests had, uh, so some among them used that knowledge instead of trying to help others to benefit themselves thereby. And when this trend became predominant, then of course, then we see the, the bad side of priesthood. Again, to not to suggest that every <coughs> person uh, you know, who is a priest is bad, but there is a potential for it. And it's not just about priesthood. The same thing, accumulation of power in any of these other groupings can be equally harmful. People who, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of talk currently about police brutality. Again, if you have a bunch of people who are well armed with guns and everything, so long as they employ the power that is invested into them <coughs> to help the community, to defend the community for a good purpose, then that's great. I mean, that's wonderful. That's exactly how it should be. But if that power that they wield is not used in a responsible way, um, a power that can get misused because of biases and prejudices, a power that can be misused to gain benefit thereby, then it becomes a danger. Same thing with regard to commerce. Again, we read a lot about um, the kind of unethical things that can go on in the banking system or in the commercial sector. So there is a potential for fraud and cheating no matter in which, which uh, section of society we are dealing with. And we'll therefore always need a section of people in every generation, in every part of the world to, to try to prevent these kind of things are happening. Again, there's another tension. People wanting to be selfish and other people trying to see that they won't allow them to misuse the power they hold. In Karma Yoga, it is said, why is work, why is work a stress? Uh, it's a stress because if we don't 
do the work in a way it ought to be done, then uh, instead of freeing us, it can create more bondage for us. And the whole of Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga is essentially about that, the right way of doing work. The right way, how do I see myself? What is my relationship to the work that I am doing? What is the purpose for the work that I am doing? What do I hope to get out of it? I, mu I must have some clarity about the answers to these questions. And so long as these answers are in tune with the principles that are explained in Karma Yoga, the work should not create stress. Um, yeah, so as, as I've often given the analogy of work being like a key, um, you turn in one way, it locks the door. You turn it the other way, it unlocks the door. So if we do work in a wrong way, uh, it creates more stress. If you do it the right way, then it becomes a source of freedom. It removes all stress. And uh, something that we will see, uh, we have seen a little bit of it before, and we'll see it going forward as well, is at least two ways of doing work to remove stress. One is to do work for work's sake. To do good because it's good to do good without expecting any benefit thereby. If I seek the results in some way, that was the 47th verse in the second chapter when Krishna says, you have the right to work but not to the fruits. So, if my primary goal in doing any work is to get a certain benefit from it, then uh, that is always going to produce stress. But if I am able to work, do something good just for the joy of doing what is good, irrespective of what the results are, then there will be less stress. If I am a devotee, if I naturally have this uh, love for God in my heart, then every work that I do, small and big, if I can do it in a spirit of worship, I can do it as an offering to God. Just like when we go to a temple, we offer flowers to the deity. And similarly, if I can do every work as an offer, every work is like a flower I offer to God. And if, if I can do that sincerely, then that work also will not produce stress in me. So if the society, people don't like the way society is functioning, what should they do? Uh, if they are already involved in society by having a family and job, do they have any opportunity? Yes, of course. Um, every one of us is in the world. Nobody is outside the world. Even people who say, I want to renounce the world, are still in the world. You are not like going to a different galaxy. I mean, the galaxy is also a part of this universe. But the world should not be in me. So just by the fact that I am still in the world, that I have a job, I have a family, I have a bunch of responsibilities, that's fine. But inside, can I remain detached? Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of, um, of a maid servant, of a maid in, in, uh, in a family. Uh, we may, may not find many of these nowadays, but but in, in India, until very recently, and perhaps even today, it is in some places, it was customary for um, some poor people from, from rural areas in search of job to come to big cities and work in the family uh, of wealthy, in a wealthy family. And uh, so the family would provide them with, with the room, boarding, and, and they pretty much lived as a part of the family. Uh, in fact, I have seen when I was growing up in, in my uncle's home, they had two, two set mates. And I've always seen them as part of the family. Only when I grew up a little bit, I realized that they were not really family. But they were so much a part of the family 
they would scold these children, who are really their master's children, scold them just like a mother would. So everything they would do, and nobody made any any distinction. So they sat with the family, ate with them, played with them, everything. But they were also paid salary at the end of the month. So now those people who worked in this way, in their heart, they knew very well they are not part of the family. Although for all appearances, they were just like everybody else. That's how Sri Ramakrishna says we have to live in the world. Yes, we'll have our career, we'll have family, children, responsibilities, everything will be there. But deep down inside, a devotee or a spiritual seeker will see that I don't belong here. That this is where God has put me, and because I love God, I'm going to carry out all my duties and responsibilities as best I can. I'm going to give my best shot, but deep down, I know that my real place is different. That's how we can be in the world and yet not allow the world to overwhelm us, the world to fill our own heart. Does a person have to consciously seek his or her dharma to discover it? Or does it sometimes just reveal itself without a focused effort to uncover it? I think we have to, every one of us has to make an effort. I mean, part of spiritual life is self-discovery. Even before we discover the spiritual center of our being, I think we should discover the human center of our being. So me, as a human being, who am I as a human being? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? I think a person who has a better self-knowledge has a better chance of not only living a happy life, but a better chance at making spiritual progress. People with lacking that kind of self-knowledge may not be able to progress much spiritually. So even before we know the spiritual center of our being, it's good to have, just understand ourselves as human beings. And then we will know what our dharma is. Now, how do we know whether what, what assessment I make of myself, whether that is accurate or not? We may not know immediately, but if we continue to live and make choices based on that assessment, through the mistakes that occur, we will know whether our original assessment was accurate or needed some revision. So it's just a trial and error process. But through, through our own experiences in life, we'll be able to refine our own self-understanding of who we are, and the better we understand ourselves, the quicker our spiritual progress will be. So, can you speak about the proper balance of discipline and restraint when it comes to spiritual practices when your work and household duties seem to pull you away from those practices? And this is a, a subject that often comes up. The, in the beginning, we have these separation between my work for my family, for my career, and my spiritual related activities. And then as long as this distinction exists, I'm, I have to live with the tension about how much of my time and energy should I give for this and how much of my time and energy I should give for that. But eventually, what we need is remove that wall that separates the two. That if I am, a spiritual life is important to me, then not only should I do my prayer, my study, my meditation in a proper way, with attention, with faith, with concentration, but I should do my shopping, I should do my taking care of my family, my work uh, at the workplace, everything else that I put in a 
basket of secular activity? Can I bring a spiritual attitude to do even those activities? Because the mind that is employed in meditation and the mind that is employed in doing shopping or vacuuming or gardening are not two different minds. So if I, my mind is filled with, with spiritual values, then when I put the same mind in doing apparently secular activities, it is still that same mind with spiritual values. So eventually, I need to bring a spiritual attitude to everything that I do in life, which, will, which is also very, a very protective thing because it will prevent me then from doing anything that is unethical or immoral. But very, it's impossible to bring a spiritual attitude to do something which is bad, which is evil. So if I can bring that spiritual attitude in every facet of life, I will also be protected. If I am truly sincere in my efforts, I will be protected from doing something that is not good for me. So that brings us to the, um, I think I have covered pretty much most or all of the questions that were asked. So thank you for your questions, thank you for your greetings and comments, and um, we'll meet again next Sunday at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Master of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be